All right. Um, I'm James Stannard. I'm uh, on a small team called the Ministry of Graphics, and we report to Andrew Goosen. Uh, we've done a lot of Xbox graphics development, but lately we've been doing a lot of PC development, especially with the X12. And I've had a pet project that we used to call the Hemi Engine. Uh, now we're calling it the Mini Engine uh, in honor of our, our team name. And it's been getting a lot more use and notoriety, so I thought I would share some uh, knowledge about it with you so that you can be familiar with it too. Uh, first, let me introduce my team a little bit. We've got Alex Nankervis, who is our lead, and he's absent today. He's at a developer visit. And myself, um, architect of the engine, I do a lot of work with compute shaders and post-processing effects. And we have a couple new recruits, Julia Cariaga, who was formerly an intern, and now she's coming up fast on 3D fractals and compute-based particle systems, including rasterization. And Fan Zhang, is that I say your name right? Yes, okay. He uh, he's also recently joined our team from ATG. Uh, he used to be on Team Hemi as well, and he does a lot with our first-party studios to help them get ready for shipping the games. Uh, so, a little backstory about the Mini Engine, or what it used to be, the Hemi Engine. Uh, I've worked at a lot of places writing game engines, and every time you leave somewhere, you have to leave your intellectual property behind. And that makes it really slow to start out on a new uh, game demo or research project that you want to do. Uh, you always have to build up your code base again with all sorts of utility classes and helper files. So I've had a pet project to, um, with my uh, current experiments that's grown and grown. And we've had contributions from other people, and especially on our team, but also from first party and even some third party contributions. And we're now making it available to other people. And I think that it's going to be great that we're giving it away, because that means that if I ever have to leave this company, I can still use it. So I will never have to reinvent the wheel again. <laughs> and we've been asked this question, is it really an engine? And in many senses of the word, yes, it is. You can have sound engines, physics engines. It's any bit of reusable code that you, you, um, you can use to get things done the things that you don't want to have to keep rewriting. Mini Engine focuses on graphics, but it has some other capabilities in it. Um, and we have created whole playable games and demos that have uh, shown off, like the Xbox One. We we made the, the game prototype Reflex for, um, before Xbox One's launch to show off Kinect. And we have some other internal projects like Savage Frontier and our model viewer that uh, are built on the engine. But no, it's not... Uh, but an engine in the typical sense where somebody can, an artist can download it and then start playing with it and create a game prototype. It's more of a, a graphics engineer's focused engine. It's like a hacker's tool. If you like playing with graphics features and exploring different techniques, then this is a really good framework for you to just get going rapidly. Uh, my personal focus is on experimenting with new hardware features and new shader techniques. So I needed a, a framework that helps me measure the differences, like with stat profiling and being able to dynamically change parameters. Um, and just to be able to get going quickly, I wanted to not have to write so much code every time uh, I start a new demo. Most of this engine is really just utility classes that accelerate what I do. Um, but it also can be a good usage case for uh, Direct 3D. It's sort of a, a a uh, state of record that this is the proper way to do something. We've debugged it, we figured it out, and we've talked with the D3D team, so um, we're pretty sure that it sort of self-documents that this is, the, this is the way to go on many things, and we can look back on that for posterity. But in a nutshell, the Mini Engine is an application framework that can create a window, initialize a device, uh, set up all your common state that you need to do an app, like your runtime loop, and your, your timers, and it, it just gets your heartbeat going. It runs on Windows 10 and Xbox One. Uh, this limitation is simply because it's all DX12 now, so you can't run before Windows 10. Um, we have controller, keyboard, mouse inputs, all the basic things that you, you want to use to interact with your engine, like file I.O., you can read and write files, I mean, all the basic utility classes. You can actually do asynchronous texture loading and zlib decompression, so that'll speed up your projects as well. It's really easy to start a new demo with it. You just inherit from iGameApp and then override three main functions. 
There's actually another one, render overlays, which is for doing your UI work, but it's optional. Uh, also included in the mini engine is a, a post-processing pipeline, and this is mainly because every time you want to render something, you don't want to have to fix it up at the end. You want to reuse all that code for anti-aliasing and for Bloom and uh, tone mapping. It's all pretty common, and you just want to uh, apply it to most things that you do, but it's also optional. You don't have to always apply it, depending on what your current process is. And all of that post-processing is done with compute shaders, which uh, since it's one of my areas of research and experiments, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of neat stuff to, to learn from there. And I'm going to go through some of the laundry list of features that, uh, that comes with it. Yeah, built into it is the CPU and GPU profiling system, which is fairly easy to use. You can either do a scoped timer or you can just say timer begin and end, and it'll add, um, add all the timers necessary to expose that. And it's all displayed on screen with a pretty easy to navigate system using a gamepad. Likewise, there's also variables that you can expose to be tweaked on screen with your controller or, or keyboard. Uh, you just give it a path and it'll um, appear magically in a hierarchy of, of variables that you can control. Text rendering is pretty much standard. You have to have that to do any of this other work. Um, got all our input handling. There's a convenience wrapper for DirectX Math that'll give you all the speed benefits of using uh, SSE, but also uh, allow you to do it in a lot more object-oriented way, uh, which will reduce the amount of typing you have to do, especially with operator overloads. Uh, you'll always need a perspective camera class rendering 3D work, and ours has some of the um, techniques du jour, like having reverse Z, and it integrates well with the other systems that are in the engine. There's a lot of um, D3D resource wrappers, like uh, color buffer and depth buffer, which allow you to a lot more easily create all the, the resource views on top of the resource and to, to manage their transition state, uh, their usage model. And also, uh, command lists can be quite tricky to start working with because there's so much setup that goes involved with creating a command list, issuing it, uh, setting fences. It's a lot of code, and it's all wrapped here with the command context object. And you can uh, you can create command context in parallel. This is a lot like the D3D11 immediate context, but um, there's no such thing as the immediate context. Um, and it's thread safe, or at least it plans to be. It's all set up to be. Um, but we have a couple of uh, still issues, specifically with resource transitions, and that's because we keep track of what state a resource is in on uh, in a global fashion that is not thread safe. Um, you need to have that per thread. And it also reduces your typing by simplifying some of the, the function calls to not have graphics or compute embedded in their name, because you can just say I'm using a, a compute context, then everything assumes that you're going to write to the graph uh, to the compute pipeline. And as I said, that it includes our post-processing library, um, which a lot of these effects have been adopted by third parties, and uh, especially AAA games that are shipping. So they're worth checking out all by themselves. But they, they can provide some standard um, benefits from rendering with the mini engine, uh, including SSAO and FXAA and motion blur and adaptive tone mapping. Our team is involved in a lot of other research, and we're doing this uh, based off of our engine uh, as a framework to experiment with. Uh, I'm working on a bokeh depth of field effect right now, and Julia is working on a tile compute rasterizer, which has a lot of benefits for performance, as well as quality, because it can sort particles with respect to multiple systems. Um, Alex Nankervis has done a lot of work with object and triangle calling, and we're, we're planning on a lot of work with execute indirect that will free up the CPU from having to read back results and to do any extra overhead. He's also done a lot of work with Forward Plus that we're um, planning on shipping example code um, on how to make it an optimal implementation. And we're definitely planning on uh, taking advantage of the multi-threaded command list generation, which is uh, a key selling point of DX12. Uh, not quite there yet, but we're, we're working towards that goal. And there's a lot of other uh, research topics I haven't even mentioned. 
specifically things that involve temporal reprojection. So in conclusion, uh, MiniEngine is many things to many people, uh, but right now it's just a small framework to get you started. And it's also sort of a self-documenting version of um, how to use DirectX 12. Uh, we have a lot of shader effects. There's probably uh, at least 100 or more shader files in, in the engine to, to pick through, and a lot of utility code that uh, the shaders use. But if you want, you can use it as a place to perform your experiments. That's free of the uh, your, your legacy code base, which can often be large, monolithic, slow to compile and link, and slow to iterate on. If you want to be agile, you might want to just try a smaller code base that you can uh, drop in a single effect and just see how it, how it performs and how it appears. There's also a lot of um, helper functions as far as that's concerned, like uh, being able to uh, zoom in on pixels to see uh, image quality, to see uh, like if you're doing an anti-aliasing effect and you want to uh, really scrutinize the appearance and difference, you could blow it up 4x and, and look at the unfiltered pixels that, uh, that close. But it's just our personal toolbox, and we're giving it away for people to experiment with because we hope that it helps save other people time, and it also we hope that people will contribute back to it and help us improve it further. But really, in a, in a nutshell, it's designed for graphics devs. It's not designed for game teams to go off and create a new game prototype. We are exploring the possibility of making it a little bit more robust so that if somebody wanted to make a game with it, uh, they would have less other uh, work to do. And uh, that's it. So if there are any questions about it, uh, feel free to shout out now. How do you get it? Uh, right now it is posted on the EAP, but that's only for PC versions. And we're planning on making an Xbox uh, release on the GDNP for Xbox licensees. Uh, if you're internal to Microsoft, then we'll find some way to just get it to you if you, if you email, email us or walk by. Oh, that's the early access preview, or uh, for the DX12 early access, uh, uh, we're getting ready for their threshold shifts. Is it going to be public or are you still thinking We're still considering that we would like to make maybe uh, as available as Codeplex or, or GitHub or something. But we'll see what the licensing rules are. I mean, we want to make it something like ATG sample framework licensing rules. We don't. Okay. Do you have any samples you can show? I didn't bring any out. I mean, this isn't even my laptop, but uh, we do have things that we can show you. Uh, we could maybe do that on another meeting. We could do yeah, some we demos. Can, if you want to see if we can capture it with the Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, uh, Andy's been asking for something that runs in both Xbox and PC, yeah. so we can yeah. compare. So this might yeah. be a. We're interested in the performance of that. Uh, you mentioned also another session of code. Can you do the same thing for shaders? Uh, if, you're, if you're running uh, one of these post processing effects, how do you measure whether the shader is uh, We can't profile within a shader, but we can profile like an entire dispatcher draw with GPU queries. Framework can, like, have it to right. measure the around the rules. Right. Yeah. It has timestamp queries uh, that it aggregates. Yes. So you said uh, currently you do not generate multiple commands at the same time, which you are keeping more loose. That's about what the challenge was. Um, yeah. There were two main hurdles I documented. Um, one is the resource barriers that I was I was talking about how. Uh, on every resource I create, I also store um, its current usage model or usage state. And when I transition it, I record its, na its now current state. But that doesn't work when you're building up command list in parallel because you don't know what uh, state it'll be in when the previous command list is executed. So that's uh, one hurdle. I think I might have to be more explicit about my resource transitions. Uh, the, leave, the, leave it up to the programmer to know what he expects it to be, he or she. Um, but the other thing is our, our GPU profiling hierarchy. Uh, it's it's just a matter of writing some code to fix it, but um, it doesn't have a way to build up the, the stat hierarchies in parallel and then connect them together. It's They're all done in sort of a FIFO order, like a push and pop stack. When you first uh, push in, say, I think it's a question, it's a question in my mm -hmm. I, I think my comments are in the field, so how did you get up? 
you will be among those in the kingdom. We have a few ideas. I've talked with Sebastian about it, um, such as having sort of a default state that you put them in at the end of a, a command list. It's been expensive in some cases. So you don't want to do it by default all the time. Right. You really need to know. Well, I think it's developed and study that for these type of resources, it is okay to put them in the default state. Because it involves decompression depending on whether it's an avatar or not. Just share that resource with you. Um, I guess the way to escape the default state. We just think some some minor things which they can do the money's actual execution. We're getting some gap that hey now I know because in the execution time I know where you're from and where you're to and I only at that time so they some small say so very transition. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that the tools do is uh, they keep track of the states as you say, uh, in absolute self transitions. Then only when you submit it to the queue, it actually resolves the, the true state of the resource. So it never keeps the, the state of the state. So it only resolves it when you have a submission, which just happens on one queue on certain specific ones. Is so that like saying that you don't know what the state is and that you want the driver to deduce it? Right. So I'm only until, yeah, until you call it to command the stock queue. Um, well, I guess this is a question for the developer community, although I know the answer <laughs> I can represent. So do you have any plan in long term to expand? I know your current focus for Vini Engine is actually Xbox One PC. In long term, do you have a plan to expand the, the platform you know, coverage to other platforms? No. <laughs> We're going to stick to Microsoft ecosystem of this. Are there differences between the Xbox One version and the PC version? There are optimizations that take advantage of uh, how the Xbox works, such as ESRAM and um, the, the P3B12.x extensions. Well, not really for you, but the P3B12.x extensions going to be important. Some, some of them, some of them, all of them. They definitely have to. That's why the Xbox might call the Xbox One X. We always like that, right? 11 and 11.x on Xbox One. Mm -hmm. Console event is not just panic, so it's not. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.